Hello. My name is Erin Strife. I'm the Director of Healthcare Services at the Clinton County Health Department. I'm going to start by just going through our numbers today. So we have a total of 49 positive tests now. 34 of those people have recovered. We have three tests that are classified as probable. That is an epidemiological classification that we have to follow certain guidelines on confirmed, probable, and suspect. So probable cases means that they've had a test result that's come back indeterminate, but that they have other reasons why they are classified as a case. I know that's been a question that's come up, so I just wanted to clarify that. We have two of those who are now recovered. One did expire. And we also have 42 suspect cases. Of those, 29 are recovered. The total tested as of this morning for Clinton County is 451. We also did have, unfortunately, two deaths of the confirmed cases. I do want to address our reporting because there seems to be a lot of discussion around this. First of all, there is not a defined limit on the number of tests that can be performed in one day. That said, we do not have enough tests to administer them to all 81,000 people in our county. I do wish we had more tests available to us. We are using the tests that are available to us to continue to work to control the spread of the virus. And testing is not treatment. I'm going to reiterate this. You've heard other people, including Dr. Collins and Dr. Ritzema with the hospital say it. The purpose of the test is to help with control measures. It helps us focus intervention so that we can control the spread of the virus. But that can still be done even without as much testing as we would like to have. The other thing that I have seen a lot of discussion around is our statistics. There is a high demand for detail in reporting, which I completely understand. That said, we are doing our best to be transparent and we will continue to report numbers. My sense is that the underlying question behind wanting to know the numbers is actually something that the numbers themselves can't necessarily provide. I think what we all really want to know is what's going to happen to us. Are we safe? Who can we trust when we don't have enough information in a situation that is completely new to us? I can give you my frank opinion, but it is an educated guess. It's not a promise or a reassurance. My opinion is that until we have a vaccine or a treatment, most of us will continue to be infected. But if we continue with these control measures that we've all been adhering to, the rate of how quickly we get infected is going to be slower so that the hospital is going to be able to care for the people who are going to need that level of care. My personal opinion is that I am going to be infected, affected and infected, but I will contract the virus at some point. Based on global statistics and my age and my health status, I'm not likely to be someone who's going to need hospitalization personally. That is an important point for all of us to think about right now though is what is our health status? Are we getting enough exercise? We should be exercising every day even if it's just little things that we do within our own household. Are we getting enough healthy food? Are we getting enough rest? Are we managing our stress? Now is also a really good time to stop smoking. What I want to emphasize here though is that for the general public knowing every single test result as soon as we at the health department know it isn't going to significantly affect anyone's life in terms of whether they're at increased risk of getting the virus necessarily. So what I mean by that is on a population level, we look at patterns and trends. And what we're seeing right now 
as a pattern is that the rate of new cases per day seems to be slowing and testing hasn't really changed. Testing is ongoing at about the same rate that it has been for the past few weeks. So that is good news. It is not a reason to let our guard down. We have to continue to be vigilant and do everything within our power to slow the spread of the disease again until there's a vaccine or until there's a treatment. One thing that you may have heard about in the news that is new is the governor is encouraging everyone to wear masks when they go out in public. This, to be clear, is so that a person who has the virus cannot spread the virus to someone else. He is not referring to hospital grade masks or medical grade masks like a surgical mask or an N95. In fact, N95s are difficult to wear for long periods of time and not recommended for the general public. They do impede the flow of oxygen to the person wearing them, so they're protective to the person wearing the mask. But in this case, what we're looking to do for people like you and me, the general public, is when we're going out and we're going to potentially be around other people or within six feet of other people, we want to wear a mask so that the droplets that come out of our mouth just when we breathe or when we speak or cough or sneeze are not going anywhere. So it's a barrier to the droplets that we would emit. And if everyone wears a mask, then we're protecting each other from each other's droplets, essentially. There has been evidence that there are a significant number of people who are able to spread the virus even though they're not visibly sick or they don't feel sick or have symptoms. So the mask wearing is a way that we can all continue to protect each other, but it's not a replacement for any of the other measures that we've been adhering to. We still have to continue the hand washing, the social distancing, the cleaning of surfaces, all of these things that we've been doing have to continue. This is an addition. I am going to go over some of the requirements for a face covering. I have a couple of examples here, but the masks that I have with me um, are not cloth masks. Some people are making cloth masks. The CDC actually has some guidance for what that should look like. They've got three different patterns. We'll put up a link to it along with this video and, and some other spots throughout our county social media pages. But the point of a mask, and right now I'm just going to use a plain dust mask, this is not a hospital grade or a surgical mask, the idea is that it covers your nose and your mouth and it fits snugly around your face. So it doesn't have to be a perfect seal. When you're putting a mask on, like this one, you hold it and you put it over your face and then you put the strap up around and over. It's a little tricky to wear with glasses and earrings. But you just gently get it to go as close to your skin as possible. Now, once you put a mask on, you leave it on for the entire duration that you need to have it on. You're not touching it. You're not taking it on and off to talk to people. Yes, your voice is going to be slightly muffled. It's not necessarily the most comfortable thing to have on your face, but every time you touch it, you are essentially touching your face. We're not supposed to be touching our faces, right? That's a way to inoculate ourselves or give ourselves the virus from our hands. So one thing that I didn't mention, but it's important to do is make sure you're washing your hands thoroughly before you're putting the mask on. Leave the mask on for the entire duration that you're going to be out in public. Then when it's time to take the mask off, again, wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. And in this case, you would take the mask like this, Try not to touch it, remove it gently, and then hang it in a place where there's sunlight or dry it in a paper bag and use a different paper bag each time that you're drying your mask. So you would alternate a couple of different masks and use them until they start to disintegrate. That is not, by the way, the manufacturer's recommendation. I'm saying this because there's a general mask shortage and we need to be conservative with our use of disposable items. So another option for a mask is a mask like this that has the ear loops and what you would do is you would take the mask, put it over your face, pull it down over your chin, and then loop it around your ears. And when you go to take it off, 
use this and avoid touching the mask. If you are someone who has COVID, whether you know it or not, the inside of the mask is now going to have bits of the virus on it. And if you've been out in public and you've been around people, it's potentially going to be the case that there will be virus particles on the outside of the mask. You don't want to touch the mask a lot, but again, if you have enough mask for you to be able to dispose of it, do so. If it's a cloth mask, immediately put it into the washer and wash and dry it. And then again, once you have it off, wash your hands thoroughly again. So a couple other things over mask. Um, if you have, again, a cloth mask with the ear loops, try to avoid touching the front of the mask at all times. That's not going to be helpful to containing the spread of the virus. And this is new to everyone. It's going to take some time to get used to it. We're all in this together. We keep saying the same thing, but that's just our reality. We are all affected right now, and we all have to work together to make sure that we're taking care of each other and that we're continuing to mitigate the spread of the virus until there's a vaccine or until there's a treatment. So keep up the good work.